In this episode, we are going to discuss a beautiful aspect of the life of our Lord Jesus Christ, His divine mercy. Jesus is mercy. The mercy of God has no beginning or end. In times of problems, crises and difficulties, we're going to unveil the tremendous treasures of the divine mercy. Welcome to Salve Maria, the podcast of the Heralds of the Gospel. Welcome to Salve Maria, the podcast of the Heralds of the Gospel. Salve Maria, welcome to this new episode. Salve Maria, Father Arthur. Salve Maria. Father Arthur is, of course, the superior of the Heralds of the Gospel here in Canada. We are also with Brother Justin Bonian. Salve Maria, Brother Salve Justin. Maria. And today there is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful topic because uh, we're going to talk about mercy and the different aspects that are not so considered in our daily life about mercy. But Father Arthur, there are so many aspects of mercy that are misunderstood these days. Uh, it seems that somehow we are entitled to sin and therefore there's no consequences. Eh? So we're going to talk about that in the program today. Absolutely. I think that Sometimes the first uh, thing that you can uh, explain about something, the, the best um, explanation that you can do about something is beginning by saying what it is not. So when you know what it is not, uh, then you understand what are we talking about. But before we delve into the topic, we would like to say Salve Maria to the different audiences that are following uh, the podcast. This is uh, Radio Maria Canada. The Catholic, um, a Catholic voice in your home. We also have the different audiences in YouTube, and uh, we just say, you know, Salve Maria to all of them. Um, now, Father, can we trace mercy to the Old Testament and the New Testament? Maybe we can give a base eh, to all of this that is going to be substantial for all those who need some guidance on the topic. Absolutely. It's extremely important to understand that God is merciful since ever. He was always merciful. So the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament is the same. There is a misconception that um, makes people think that in the Old Testament, you know, God was very rigid and was very severe. It was, it was da, 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 da. zero tolerance for everything and God would zero kill you immediately. Exactly. If you... And then now he's uh, soft. He became soft. And then now, okay, he's all mercy, you know. Maybe forget, the commandments were just justice. relaxed and now... <laughs> this is completely happen. wrong. This is completely wrong. Uh, it is the same God. And in the Hebrew language, there is a word that is extremely important to know that uh, defines... Uh, what is love, and is the word hesed, H-E-S-E-D, hesed. And uh, it is mentioned like 250 times in the, uh, in the Old Testament. And um, it's a, it makes reference to the love, the kindness, the compassion, the grace, the faithfulness of God, that he is hesed. And one of the most important um, reference to Hesed is in the book of Exodus in, in, mm -hmm. the, in, the, um, in the in the in uh, the in the the first five books of the of the gospel in the Hes, uh, Exodus in in Exodus 34 our lord speaks to Moses and he says the lord the lord a god gracious and merciful slow to anger and abundant in hesed <laughs> and it is translated in english as love and fidelity they have to put two words to translate the, the word hesed is so difficult. It's such a wonderful concept of that God is hesed. God is merciful. And God wants to do it. Hesed is not something that the person is for himself. It is He is for the others. So God is that for us. You also see that throughout the, um, the later prophets in the Old Testament. Hosea and many of the others, you see this love that God has for his people, and it's not returned. The images that are talked about in Jeremiah and in Hosea and many of the others is this unrequired love, this love that goes out from God that is not returned. And with love comes mercy. So this is what it is. It's God wanting good for us, wanting this constantly. And we are not responding properly. That is the biggest problem that you have with the misconception of mercy. True, in the Old Testament, God was hard. 
But he also talked about the fact that they could not listen, they did not obey, and they were a stiff-necked people. They would not convert. They would not turn back. So the problem was us, not him. It's always the eternal drama you know, of salvation, put it that way, you know, because God wants to love us. He gives us free will. He, he gives us all the elements to love him freely. And yet we don't can respond to that love. Huh? Exactly. Already in one of the Psalms, Psalm 29, the Holy Spirit inspires these uh, beautiful uh, words in the, to the psalmist and says, Lord, do not deal with us according to our sins. So remember that the, 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 uh, the Psalms is something that the Holy Spirit inspires the one who wrote the Psalm as something that God wants to listen. Mm -hmm. He wants to listen what is in the Psalms. Hmm? The pleading that happens within the Psalms is that of a soul which is truly open to God's love and mercy. Exactly. The problem is, is that we who recite it don't have the proper compunction. Precisely. It's the fault of us, not God. God's trying to teach us, say, this is how you do it. Ask me this. You messed up. This is yeah, how we do it. Exactly. And then we take it and we do it all backwards. Say, how come it doesn't work? Well, you've done it backwards. You've, you've done it wrong, but I'm going exactly. to teach you again and again and again. That's the whole Old Testament. It's this constant lessons that because he, he didn't listen. Because he's hesitant, he never gets tired. No. He, he continues trying to, to save us. So he says, remember not against us the iniquities of our past. Don't remember our past. Hmm? Don't remember our sins. Exactly. May your compassion quickly come to us for we are brought very low. So we, we, we came very well, low. Why are we very low? Because of our sins. Exactly. Not because God punished us. No, no, no. It's important. Again, this is the issue. God isn't the bad guy in the story. He's the one trying to alleviate the problem that we brought on our own selves. Exactly. So as, as he wants to be kind to us, he puts in the psalm what we should ask him. And he says, Lord, do not deal with us according to our sins. It means that God has decided not to deal with us according to our sins. According think, to justice in I the end. I think another way we could <laughs> mm -hmm. make it a little easier for the people listening is, let's translate the word sin to crime. Yeah. So we're criminal. We're criminals, exactly. And we're asking not to be treated according to our crimes of commission. We have committed these crimes. So are, is God really harsh? That's a question. Is he being harsh? But we need to no, think also that not. in heaven there is no space for anything but perfection. Mm -hmm. And so we need his mercy to attain there, well, to get into that, our that perfection to, to, to get close. In Latin, no misericordia, no, it goes in that line, is to have a heart for those in need. Because so. God turns towards our uh, shortcomings and makes our problems his problem. And he wants to, to, to save us. No? Basically, that. he's saying to us, don't get discouraged about you because of your past. Don't get discouraged because of your past. Regardless of what happened to you, if you want to go forward, if you want to be perfect, as you just mentioned, then there is a solution because I am hesitant, I am mercy, I, I will uh, bring you up. And everything that's good that has come about before this point, will be brought forward because I don't remember those faults. Exactly. I'm willing to continue. Although your guilt is as uh, brilliant as scarlet, scarlet, that image is very important. We understand our fault, but God is willing to overlook it to bring us forward. Yes. Now, that doesn't mean that if we don't repent, still we will have mercy, you know, everything will be fine. Oh yes, you can sin. And then at the end of, of the story, God is mercy, and you're going to go to, to heaven. See, there's a problem. A lot of people have this idea that they, they say a little prayer, last minute, and they get to go to heaven. I think for many people, their total goal of their spiritual lives is the good thief. And misconstrued good thief. Exactly. That they, that the In last the last minute, moment. They can say a little, Lord have mercy on me, and then all of a sudden I go to heaven. Everything's good. Um, how, many did, how many people did that happen to? Was it, un was it required or was it unrequired? But also God, God wants need us. need to do it or not need to do it? No, the, the good thief, he repented mm. of all his past. 
So he asked uh, uh, the Lord, you know, um, please forget my past because I am repented and I love you. He had perfect contrition. Exactly. Perfect contrition. He wasn't an imperfect contrition and it wasn't interested. No. Not Many of these other images that we're talking about no. are interested. I want to get. I want to make a little trick that I don't have to pay the penalties. That's interested. <laughs> now, in the New Testament, we also have many, many occasions in which our Lord Jesus Christ will show how merciful He is. And um, there is the, the parable of the prodigal son. Saint John Paul II, in his um, uh, encyclical, it was the second document that he produced, uh, Mitis Misericordia. Uh, it means. Um, uh, rich in mercy. He is going to use the parable of the prodigal son as showing how, you know, regardless of what the, the son has done to the father, the father is always waiting for him. If he comes back, he will receive him. If he doesn't come back, actually the father doesn't go uh, to look for him because he was not repented. But if he repents, he will receive them, receive him, him. If he repents, he will receive him and he will give him even more than what he had before. Hmm. Now, there is the other parable, which is very important to, to take into consideration, that, that brings the, the balance, is the parable of the unforgiving servant. So this king, he, uh, our Lord Jesus Christ, is answering to Peter when Peter asks him, how many times should we forgive? Is it seven? <laughs> Meaning, you know, seven meant perfection, meant, meant uh, always. And our Lord Jesus Christ says, no, no. Not seven, but 70 times seven. It means that it's much more, you know. It's mind-blowing. Absolutely. It was like the way of speaking was mind-blowing. It was whatever you think is the ultimate, just take that ultimate and times it by itself. It has nothing compared to what I want to bring. Hmm? So this king has a, a servant. The servant owes him a, a tremendous debt. It was a debt that it was more or less 20 years of his of salary. You know? Impossible to pay. So... This um, servant asked the king for forgiveness. And the king, moved by compassion, it said in the parable, he um, forgives of all the debt that he has with him. And he lets him free. But what happens is that this one then finds somebody else who owed him a little debt. It was only a hand. Infimal, infimal amount yeah, in infimal, comparison. Yeah. It, it was All like, he needed was patience. Exactly. It would be paid back. He needed patience. And, uh, and he didn't want to forgive him. Then what happens? The king gets furious. Then the king, you know, is, now it's justice. You, you refuse my mercy. Now you're going to have uh, pure, justice. Uh, pure justice. And then he throws him into the into, um, debtor's prison in the prison till he pays the, the the last penny but of course it's impossible to pay so it is a, a reference of the eternity of hell the eternity of condemnation so god wants us to take refuge in his divine mercy in other words yes in the old testament in the new testament misunderstood by the people in the old testament uh, confused in still in the new testament but in reality we could tell no, our audience that well, this is what God wants. God wants us to go and take refuge in that infinite mercy He He's ready to bestow upon us. Absolutely. He doesn't uh, cancel justice. Justice is always there. But it is an encouragement saying, look, it is a good deal. Repent and look what you're going to receive. So our Lord is doing, doing everything to save the person. I think also it's important to define what justice is. To give each what it's due. Exactly. So it's not tyranny, it's not torture, it's not unjust. It's giving to each what of is course. due. So you committed this crime, you receive what is due. You, 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 you um, did an act of virtue, you get what is due. And in reality as well, he prepares us uh, to a, a huge act of um, humility. Because it is not in us to recognize that we do wrong. And that's not the original sin. The original sin wants always to pretend Hubris. that everything is perfect, that we never commit any mistakes. All God wants is that repentance. It is beautiful. When we sh you show humility to God, He will always answer you with His mercy. 
not because you show humility that he will be harsh on you. No, he will be mercy because you are humble. So we are going to talk about the divine mercy that um, our Lord Jesus Christ kind of revealed to um, to Sister Faustina in many many occasions, uh, approximately four during four years of her life. Our Lord Jesus Christ appears to her and he says wonderful things about uh, his mercy. Some things are new, but they are in uh, in line with everything that was known before. It's not that he uh, invents something new, because as we said in the beginning, God is always the same. There's nothing new in him. God was always mercy. So um, it is very interesting to, to consider that this uh, woman was a very, very simple uh, girl from a poor family in Poland. She was uh, born in 1905. And uh, she felt a religious vocation since her childhood. But the parents didn't want to let her go. <laughs> this happens. Actually, this is happens more often than not. <laughs> Other audience, those who, those who have children, <laughs> take a so. note, because sometimes exactly. it could be difficult. Huh? You may be, you know, if you don't leave your son, your daughter in a good direction, you will be, may, may be, you know, um, avoiding a Faustina to become a saint. Mm -hmm. So be very careful. Right? Very careful. <laughs> so uh, she she ends up going with her sister to a ball. This is the ultimate recruitment. Yeah. <laughs> this is, <laughs> and during this event, our Lord Jesus Christ appears to her all uh, with the signs of the flagellation. Hmm? Can you imagine? Yes. All, all, <laughs> only in blood, you know. And, uh, and he asked her, till when are you going to make me suffer? There we go. <laughs> so for Sina, then she realizes that this is very serious. I, I have to <laughs> have to uh, to pick my do something about this quickly. And she goes and speaks with her father. And finally, they agree for her to go. And she goes to um, Krakow, if I'm not, not mistaken. She goes to Krakow, but she didn't know anybody there. And she arrives there, and uh, she uh, uh, she goes to uh, to some convent, but they don't receive her. Then finally, there is a lady who who, uh, who offers her uh, lodging for for one night, and then our Jesus Christ tells her, "No, look, go to that convent, and uh, which is the convent of Our Lady uh, of um, the, the Sisters of Divine Mercy, the Sisters of of, uh, of Divine Mercy." Mm -hmm. Our Lady Providential, eh? God, God guiding her, the the Sisters of Our Lady of Mercy, so. It's um, it's it's the it's the mercy of Mary. Uh, it's yeah. interesting because the mercy of Mary and the mercy of Jesus is the same. Two hearts, right? exactly. And it's Take nice, and it's nice that that the sister called to reveal the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, went to the convent of Mary <laughs> because of there. But it's very proper. <laughs> yes, it it's is through Jesus. To get to the heart of Jesus, you go through the heart of Mary. Exactly. Beautiful. But apparently the master of novices or the superior who, or, or, the, or the nun who spoke to her was very, very direct. She said, well, for us to um, receive you here, you need to ask permission to the owner of the house. Exactly. So she goes to the chapel and she starts praying and our Lord says, no, no, you are right. This is the place to be. So she goes and talks to the sister and the sister says, well, if he allows you in, Oh, I love you too. Exactly. You too. <laughs> <laughs> but that type of faith is impressive. It's tangible. It's mm. real. Yeah. Which shows how much she was called no, for, for this vocation. So uh, she has many um, uh, revelations. And uh, our Lord asked her to, um, to do a painting of himself. And he appears um, in a certain way and uh, tells Faustina that he has to be painted uh, uh, this way. And actually, it is good to know that two paintings were done. There's the first one and the second one. For some reason, that, that happened because of persecution of the communists who tried to, to burn the, uh, the first painting, etc. The, um, the second painting is more known than the first. Mm -hmm. But for Faustina, the first was better than, than the second one. So, this is mm -hmm. the first one. Mm -hmm. This is the first one that uh, was uh, was done still when Faustina was alive. Mm -hmm. And then, 
there was a, a Polish painter who did the second one, who actually was finished after her death. She dies in 1938. So after her death, this uh, painting is, uh, is done, and it becomes uh, very, very much known. And uh, our Lord shows that from his heart, he has two rays you know, of light that comes. One is red and one is white. And red uh, represents all the blood that the Lord Jesus Christ um, has shed for our salvation. And the white represents all the light and the, the, the kindness that the Lord Jesus Christ has for us. And it's a clear reference to the crucifixion, no? the moment when he exactly. dies. Exactly. I mean, blood and water. Blood and water. Blood and water. Blood and water. Then we have the, um, the Novena mm -hmm. of, um, of Divine Mercy. We have the Feast of the Divine Mercy, maybe we could mention this now, which uh, was established as the second Sunday. I think right now we're on the Vespers of it. We're on the Vespers. Tomorrow. Exactly. Yeah, it's tomorrow, so it's tomorrow. a very, very timely program, this one. Uh, on the second Sunday after Easter, which is very appropriate because... Easter is the moment in which our Lord Jesus Christ exactly dies and all his blood and, and his uh, um, uh, water comes from his heart for our salvation. So to, uh, to bring exactly, to make it effective, all his mercy on our lives. Hmm. So at this point, we could say that we resume, we, we, we put together the very initial aspects of the divine mercy in what really mm, will need our audience to understand very well theologically with the catechism as well, how important it is to rely in divine mercy, not to abuse of divine mercy, but what are their characteristics. So we propose that we go to a commercial break and we come back with the seven aspects that are more unknown about this divine mercy uh, devotion. Hold on, stay until the end, and then we come back in a moment. If you're liking this program, there are ways to support it. And one of those is to acquire the latest book we have for children, St. Faustina and the Divine Mercy. In this book, children can learn about divine mercy, children can learn about the life of St. Faustina, and you as a parent, maybe as an uncle, as an educator, can help them to discover this beautiful treasure. The book is available in versions in English, Spanish, and French, and you can order right away in the notes of the program. So order your copy today, St. Faustina and the Divine Mercy, comes in three languages and it's going to be a beautiful gift for your children, for somebody else's children, and even for yourself. So welcome to the second part of the program today dedicated to divine mercy. So Father, we were going to uh, perhaps touch on the seven aspects of divine mercy, the ones that are more fundamental and the ones that are going to help tremendously our audience, not only to understand the feast of tomorrow, divine mercy, but also to start opening the heart to this phenomenal treasure that our Lord Jesus Christ wants to bestow upon us. I think it's good to know also what uh, late Pope John Paul II had in mind when he uh, instituted this, um, this feast. Hmm? Yeah, I mean, one of the points of St. John Paul II with Divine Mercy is how fundamental it was to his pontificate and how much he actually, in his own writings, talked about it being core. Right, so it's not a question that we are saying it was a core element. It's what he said exactly. it was core. So I'll give you one quote. And this is from November the twenty second, nineteen eighty one. So right at the beginning of his pontificate, and this was in the shrine of merciful love in Italy. Right from the beginning of my ministry in Saint Peter's See in Rome, I consider this message of divine mercy my special task. Providence has assigned it to me. In the present situation of man, the church, and the world, it could be said that precisely the situation assigned that the message to me as my task before God. That's pretty serious. Amazing. Yeah. So it requires an institution of a feast that is just following Holy Week, following the resurrection. Immediately he you know, needs yeah. to recall the, that question of mercy. And later in the shrine of divine mercy in Krakow, he said this on June the 7th, 1997. 
some years later, many years later, he says, those who sincerely say, Jesus, I trust in you, will find comfort in all their anxieties and fears. There is nothing that man needs more than divine mercy, that love which is benevolent, which is compassionate, which raises man above his weaknesses to the infinite heights of the holiness of God. So let's start then on the first aspect, which is precisely the actual feast of the divine mercy, but it's very handy to quote what Sister Faustina herself heard from our Lord referring to that day. Because it is not just, let's say, oh, well, we celebrate on that day and it's another liturgical feast. It's the moment when, he says, the gates of his mercy open in a very particular manner, right? Flood the earth. I think if I'm not mistaken here, um, this was entry uh, 699 in yes. her, in her diary. Yeah. Um, if, you, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll, I'll read it. Um, on that day, the very depths of my tender mercy are open. So the very, very important on that day, you know, we, we have to wait. I mean, tomorrow, no, <laughs> let's take advantage of this. Right? I pour out an a whole ocean of graces upon those so souls who approach the font of my mercy. Again, I think it's important here, approach, which means you have to make an effort. Yes. You have to go. It's like the pool of Siloa in the, in the Old Testament. You had to go to the pool. If you didn't make it, you didn't get it. It means that if you don't want to be forgiven, then uh, God can do anything for you. But it's up to you. It's up to the person. Yeah. The soul that will go to confession and receive Holy Communion shall obtain complete forgiveness of sins and punishment. That's huge. Beautiful. But there's an action on your behalf. Absolutely. But remember also that our Lord Jesus Christ instituted confession on the, uh, on, on the, on the Easter uh, night. Hmm? It was on the day of his resurrection when he appeared to the apostles in the synagogue that the Lord Jesus Christ instituted the sacrament of confession, the sacrament of his mercy, the sacrament of forgiveness, of uh, bringing people up uh, from sin. Absolutely. So this feast is extremely related to, to the most important feast of, uh, of the year, which is Easter. It's a, it's a, it's a, it might say it's a way of putting it in proper focus. Precisely. On that day, all the divine floodgates through which graces flow are opened. So what a wonderful opportunity. Eh? God does not make an impossible for us to start a new life. All he wants is a contrite and humble heart. But in that same, in one of in one of Sister Faustina's writings, it had an interesting point there. God, in His great mercy, is giving mankind a last chance for salvation. Well, for some specialists, that's a connection with Fatima. I don't know what what do you think? Absolutely, because, a tremendous connection. Uh, I think no, some people are calling the attention on that. In a certain sense, Fatima and Divine Mercy are two sides of the same coin. Oh, I think so. Because. Uh, in, in Fatima, Our Lady says, be careful, if you continue like this, there's going to be a big chastisement. And then Our Lord Jesus Christ says, but if you turn to me, I will forgive you. Everything will be you know, over. Turn to me and ask for forgiveness. And don't forget, um, the Sacred Heart will appear to Sister Lucy later on after the appearances in Fatima of Our Lady. So yes. we have to keep that in mind. It's not like it's one or the other. It's, the we don't, it's a sure. both hand. Absolutely. Beautiful. Well, the second aspect is very well known, but it would be nice to remind as well, is the actual uh, painting. Because there is also a very beautiful aspect of it, is that our Lord comes from darkness. No, yes. no matter the first or the second version we were talking about uh, yes. in, the, in the earlier part of the program, it, it's not by chance that the background is, all, is, is completely black. It's that He comes in a moment in which everything is black, is pitch black, and then he comes communicating these rays of light, which are you know, whitish and red. How providential and how beautiful. Absolutely, absolutely. And then, Jesus, I trust in you. It, uh, already Lord Jesus Christ is telling us what is our attitude in front of him. Trust. Trust is, is the only attitude that we should have uh, in front of Jesus. There's no room for fear. No. Exactly. Beautiful. Do not be afraid. And so this is, this is also a devotion that brings us to trust, brings us, uh, in a sense, is not um, against 
images, right? It's the opposite. It brings the true Catholic value of images. And the third aspect that comes right now is also the aspect of prayer, because the third aspect talks about a novena that has to start um, on Good Friday and be completed by the Saturday before Divine This might end. sound a little ridiculous, but a novena is made up of nine days of prayer. Unfortunately, we have many um, customs within the church today. They use the term novena, and it's not nine days. I've no. heard someone <laughs> say that they were doing a 10-day novena. I'm like, yeah. I'm confused. <laughs> I don't understand what you're talking Three about. Three-week novena, no. Three-week novena, <laughs> six-month novena. No, 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 it's not novena. Then it's something else. Change your terminology. Nine days, right? Starting Good Friday, you know, the day that our Lord dies on the cross. So it's really important. It, it puts it in, again, in perspective. Nothing is ended. The saddest day, you may say, of the liturgical calendar is Good Friday. And what are we doing? I trust in you. We're well, with Our Lady. Our Lady trusted that the fulfillment of everything that was going to happen was going to happen. What happened to the apostles? They lacked faith. Precisely. Our Lady <clears throat> didn't. So we're praying this novena <clears throat> with whom? With Our Lady. And also the novena reminds how much of a Lord comes to cure. Because there are days that are specifically reserved for each and every one of us, no? Yeah. For the lukewarm, <laughs> for yeah. priest and religious, devout and faithful, for the sinful, for the souls of little children. I, there is a space for everybody. But I think all of us, Beautiful. at times, we fall into those different boxes. Some days we're lukewarm, some days we're sinful, some, some days we are the little children. The fourth aspect, Father, the hour of divine mercy. Can we... Tell something about the audience. Uh, it's beautiful that it's a three, no? At the same time in which the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross. He decided to die, you know, because he he died when he wanted. Oh, absolutely. Everything that, that happened to him was uh, his will. And he decided to die in the middle of the day, in, in which uh, the day reaches its peak and then starts going down. He, he decided to die in the, in the highest uh, time of the day, uh, which is uh, at uh, around 3 p.m. And this is uh, the moment in which uh, our Lord Jesus Christ wants to open his heart because actually his heart was open on the cross. Physically. Physically. Exactly. It wasn't just a figurative idea. By Longinus, the, the, this uh, Roman soldier that came with his um, lance, and he opened the heart for what? For mercy. He opened uh, the heart of Jesus to... Uh, to, um, uh, to shed mercy upon uh, mankind. According to tradition, Longinus, when he pierced the side of our Lord, that blood and water poured down, and it also affected him. He had been hurt. His face, his eye had been damaged in war. He had been a centurion, and he was cured on the spot. So he received mercy, even though he was inflicting precisely something terrible on but our the message, huh? But that's us. We yeah. inflict through our sins, we afflict damage. We are Longinus. To the Each church. one of us, when we sin, we, we, we are Longinus. We hurt the church, yeah. the mystical body of Christ. And what, we, what do we receive in return? Condemnation. No, we're cured of our cured. sins. Now, there are beautiful words here that St. Faustina Fantastic. records in her diary, and she says that that hour of divine mercy it is the hour of great mercy for the whole world. It is Jesus' desire that the moment of his death on the cross uh, should be venerated at 3 p.m. So yes, every time we stop and we at 3 p.m. say that. Yeah. By the way, it can, it can be done any day, no? every day that you want. Absolutely, okay, yes, no? it can be done any time. Absolutely. Yeah. There's no, uh, and it's actually very convenient because Divine Mercy uses common rosary beads. Oh, yeah. So And, and the prayers, again, mm -hmm. are common prayers that I would suspect, I would hope, any Catholic would know. Well, this brings us to the next aspect, the mm -hmm. fifth aspect in our list, which is the actual the recitation chaplet. of the chaplet. Actually, you don't need a, a special rosary to pray, to pray this chaplet. You can use the, the normal rosary of, uh, of Our Lady to pray, uh, which is very nice, no? It means that the same rosary is for Jesus and Mary, no? <laughs> It's not something that's contradictory. Very nice. There's no, no uh, opposition. According to Sister Faustina, it was uh, the best time to pray the, um, the, the chaplet would have been after receiving Holy Communion. I think for some people, it doesn't take, it takes about, I think, five, six minutes to pray the, yeah, the chaplet. Yes, it is. No, very you could almost use it as a, a, method, a method of doing your thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. 
if you don't have another method, it's, it's okay. something at least keeps you on mark of what you have just received sure. and not worrying about what your neighbor's wearing mm-hmm. in church. And it's especially recommended, she says, to be prayed at the moment when someone is dying. Because actually we are invoking <laughs> those floodgates of mercy to, to be opened upon that person who is about to make the travel, the trip at to three, eternity. At 3 p.m. was the most important moment in the life of Lord Jesus Christ because he died. Also for the person, the most important time in his life in the moment in which, when the person dies. That's, that's you know, the highest peak of his life. Absolutely. Yes. The sixth aspect of the Divine Mercy now is the Sacrament of Reconciliation and Communion. Can we say a a word about that, Father? Because that will be tremendously interesting for our audience as well. The Sacrament of Reconciliation actually uh, has many names and um, and it's difficult really to find the perfect name for the Sacrament because our Lord Jesus Christ didn't give a name for for the Sacrament. But uh, obviously... That is the sacrament of mercy. It's uh, uh, the in the sacrament of reconciliation, the penitent will say the truth about himself. In um, in being honest uh, and saying all the, the sins that he has committed, but the Lord Jesus Christ will say the truth about himself, mm. which is that he is mercy, he is hesed, he is love, he is compassion, he is the one who wants to help you, and. Uh, to lift you up, etc. I think also, which is interesting, at this period of time, in the, in the 30s and 20s and before, the Catholic Church, um, in certain places in more particular, they were falling into a little bit of Jensenism. So the, the, the frequency of the, of the sacraments was lessening because there was this rigidity, bad rigidity going on, um, in which um, the idea that if you use the sacraments... Uh, are you sure that you are properly disposed to receive the sac? And if you're not properly properly disposed, then you shouldn't avail yourself. Um, in that sense, this divine mercy was important to remind people what the purpose of these sacraments were. It wasn't a sacrament for the perfect. It was it was for those that were broken and damaged. So the sacrament of mercy. reconciliation is only for the perfect to be used once every ten years or something. I guess so. Keep them perfect. I'm not sure. <laughs> I wow. haven't met too many perfect people yet. So, Precisely because we are not being saved because we are good. Mm. We are being saved because Jesus is merciful, because he is going to, to cure us. Mm. And that's probably what infuriates the devil the most, because right. all his efforts to lose everyone based on pride, and all of a sudden the person mm, has an act of uh, humility, of recognizing all the sins and so on, and now his deeds are... Done. I, for, I forgot where I read this, but since the devil doesn't have faith, can't see grace because he doesn't have faith. That's true. He sees a soul that he's tempting and tempting and getting to right that right spot, and then all of a sudden, poof, he does a leap and disappears, and and now he's on the way to virtue. And you're like, what happened? <laughs> How did it happen? I had everything lined up. He had done this. He had done that. He had, and then what? Grace, divine mercy. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, let's go now to the seventh aspect, but one that is extremely interesting because someone would say, okay, so this mercy comes to us and so on, but also Jesus wants us to do something about our life. And he gives a very practical advice here. He says the seventh aspect is specifically deeds of mercy. Because, okay, we expect God to act with mercy towards us, and in turn, we also need to perform deeds of mercy. This is an issue. Um, I bumped into people um, quite devout to divine mercy, but they treated divine mercy, in a sense, sort of like a magical prayer. You say this prayer before you die and you go to heaven, and there was no deed element. There was nothing you did. There was nothing you cooperated with. It was faith. It was like a sola fide situation. They're like, you just need to believe in it would happen. Kind of like magic. But nothing in our faith is like that. It's all prayers and good works, virtue and, and asceticism. It all has that full package. And this devotion is no different. Let's go to the, the, the en- this entry in uh, Sister Faustina, Faustina's diary mm-hmm. in 742 that says, Our Lord, she records, say, Our Lord saying, I demand from you deeds of mercy which are to rise out 
of love for me. So that it's is... Not philanthropy. Isn't it? It's, it's not philanthropy, it's charity. You yeah, need to course. move. <clears throat> and then he says, you are to show mercy to your neighbors always and everywhere. How different it is from uh, different uh, aspects of... Uh, all of a sudden, no, I'm not going to forgive anyone. No, I, I never forget. How many people say, no, I forgive, but they never forget. Um, are we sure that that is something right? You have to love your neighbor. You don't have to like your neighbor. Of you need course. to forgive. Forgive from the heart. And that's not going to be easy. It's so important, this attitude, which is in the Our Father, no? Our Lord Jesus Christ put it in the most important prayer that we have, that if we don't forgive, we're not going to be forgiven. You must not shrink from this and try to excuse or absolve yourself from it. That's exactly the problem. Yeah. So, so once again, there's no magic formula. This is not a magic devotion, you know. I say my chaplet of divine mercy, I'm going to go to heaven. Oh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> it's not like this, yeah. It might help. It might help, of course. But it's not like an automatic thing. And you, okay, you gossip. You, you, you slander oh, yeah. people. You, you spread rumors. But you say your Divine Mercy Chaplet. Okay. After you do all that, over tea, you have Divine Mercy Chaplet. You're very holy. <laughs> <laughs> now, our Lord continues, eh? and he says, yes. I am giving you three ways of exercising mercy towards your neighbor. So this is given by Jesus himself. He gives three ways. The first, by deed. The second, by word. The third, by prayer. So deed, word, and prayer. Of course. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Be good to remember not the, uh, the the works of uh, of charity. Uh, there are corporal and there are spiritual. There are seven uh, main works of um, of charity, which uh, the first one is feed the hungry. Of course, that's what the church has done since the very beginning. Sure. The first hospitals were founded by the church. Works of mercy. Our Lord Himself He multiplied bread and, and fish. Uh, he cured the sick. But he also says that these are an unquestionable way to show mercy on our behalf, as he teaches us. No, he, he even says, by these means, a soul glorifies and pays reverence to my mercy. So if we so want to associate... So we're reflecting his mercy precisely. in our own lives. See that there's no magic formula. Mm -hmm. It's a true life-changing event. The second one is to clothe the naked, those who have... No, um, no means. No means of uh, sur uh, survival, etc. We have to help them uh, to survive at least. Uh. Comfort the prisoners, those who who are paying their debt, you know, for for a crime that they have committed. We have to, to support them. Also, that, that means is to help them towards conversion. Mm -hmm. Precisely. Precisely. Then to bury the dead. Respect. The respect that the church has always had towards the dead, you know, arranging funerals and the like. Give drink to the thirsty. So bringing a glass of water to someone who needs <laughs> it is, after all, uh, an act of... As, uh, but making sure we're doing it for the love of God. Shelter the homeless. Even give me some home, uh, a space for them to live. No? So beautiful. No? To those in need. And uh, uh, visit the sick. So, so console the sick. The church takes care of that also with the anointing of the sick. Those ministries that the church has towards working with the homebound and the shut-ins and the ones in hospital. But sometimes it's people who just need, are, are locked into their own selves. And they're, in the sense, they are, they're, they're lost. And they need someone to bring them mercy. Yeah. Just a word, maybe. It could be, a word you know, to be there. Be there for them. Just a greeting and something, you know. To know that they, they are not forgotten, that somebody remembers them and wants to talk to them, etc. It can cure a person. Eh? Well, it, it, but it's, see, what's important here is that um, we don't believe in just the body or the soul. We don't have that dichotomy. We don't split those two things. We're complete persons. One. So, we're one. We're, <clears throat> we're not just, no, I take care of my soul. I don't care about my body. We don't have that. So it's important. So that's in interesting, sorry, Father, but the, the corporal works of mercy, it's, it's a fascinating thing that there are seven. We have seven sacraments. You have, uh, seven is everywhere. <laughs> it's just really beautiful. And if we are going to attain perfection in our works of mercy, we need to practice this seven, because seven brings us 
towards fulfillment. But the problem here is that our next seven are are super important too. Sometimes people yeah. get locked into the corporal. They they help um, soup kitchens, which are incredibly important. Very or they important, help, um, of course. The street people they need they need help. Fine, but then they forget the other aspect, which is the spiritual works of mercy. Incredibly more important than the than the uh, the corporal ones because they're going to deal with something that is eternal, which is the soul of the person. So what are they? Teach the ignorant. This is fantastic education. Uh, teach people, uh, uh, especially the faith, uh, especially, especially the, faith. The, the, the religion. Catechism. Catechism. Talking about evangelization, yes. Exactly. This is what exactly. is divine mercy? No? <laughs> this is what we're doing now. We, we are doing a, an act of... You can spiritual. share the podcast yeah, as well. Yes, <laughs> <very good. laughs> then we have um, uh, correct the sinners. This is something... Difficult to do, but extremely important. Huh? Someone who's going to on a wrong path to be able to to speak to, with him and alert him and warn him. You know, this but is not done, good but for done with him mercy. or her. Hmm? Done with mercy. Done with yeah, understanding. Exactly. Exactly. Console the sorrowful. Those who are suffering. Super important. Super important yeah. um, ministry. And also opening their eyes towards God's mercy, because when someone is in pain, when someone is in deep sorrow for the loss, maybe of someone, some some relatives, you know, it's important to remind the, the, all these questions. That was something mercy. that Saint John Paul II talked a lot about, which was the salvific suffering. The suffering will save you, and it's something which, in our world today, with euthanasia and everything else, is being oh, yeah. forgotten. Then we have forgive wrongs willingly. Yeah, willingly is the important part. There. Important part. <laughs> <laughs> So we have to forgive, but not just by word, we have to really by heart. Hmm? If we want God to forgive our wrongdoings, we also need to forgive somebody else's wrongdoings towards exactly. us. And remember that, that um, God, your Father, Lord Jesus Christ said, who, who sees the inside will give you the reward. So it's not enough to say something, you have to really have it in your heart. Pray for the living and the dead. We have to pray. Prayer is an extremely important uh, And again, that's act. something wrong with our society today. Uh, firstly, a society doesn't pray. But the idea of remembering the dear departed, remembering to pray for them, having masses said for, those, for their souls, um, people even making conditions for their, um, in their last will, they're, they're parceling up all their monies, but they forget that they should have masses said for their soul for whatever period of time that they would desire, but they forget about this. They forget about taking care of themselves in the most important way. It doesn't matter how beautiful your your coffin is. No. What matters is where you end up. Exactly. <laughs> There's also something controversial here, Father, eh? because uh, one of those spiritual works of mercy, of mercy talks about correcting sinners. And someone would say, well, but... Uh, what about judging? By oh, correcting sinners, judge. aren't we judging them? And this is a question that we are making. You can also put there in the comments in the program, if you're still with us, because it's very, very important that we know your opinion. So what is it, Father? Can we correct sinners and yet not judge them? This is a tremendous subject because actually there is a big confusion in the minds of many faithful. Huh? I have been judging. And they confuse between judging and condemning. One thing is to judge, and another thing is to condemn without judging. And unjustly. And unjustly. That's rash judgment. Exactly. So, but when you see the fact in front of you, and it's blatant, and it's obvious, were you supposed to go along with it? Is that your not. option? Even though I'm not a judge, but I have to distinguish between good and bad. When you drive a car, do you judge? Of course. I hope you do. <laughs> Otherwise, we're all dead. Um, when you decide to cook, do you judge? Of course. Because if you don't, your food's a disaster. <laughs> your spiritual life, if you don't judge good from evil, right from wrong, you have a disaster. You have this hodgepodge of disasters happening. And it's very sad because people justify saying, no, I don't judge, so I won't be judged. But they don't even know what our Lord was talking about, who he was talking to in that passage from the Gospels. And that's a whole other story to get into, and we're not at the point to be able to go there. But it's such an important element. 
So it's, important. it's a matter for future discussion, no? but yes. it's very, very interesting. Though we can say time. you need more time, but we can say that uh, in as under a certain aspect, judging means distinguishing between good and evil. It is. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's fulfilling your purpose as a Christian. Our Lord said, "May your speech be yes, yes, no, no." Didn't say maybe, maybe. Mm -hmm. If you're not judging, you're maybe, maybe. No. Be you hot or cold, I will accept you. Lukewarm, I spit you in my mouth. So we saw six, Father, and now we have one more. Bear wrongs patiently. Oh, boy. Oh, my goodness. That's difficult. We can bear wrongs, but patiently is hard. <laughs> Patience is a big, big, big problem that, uh, that people have to, uh, to face during all their lives. Hmm? I, I lack of patience. It's so common. People. I, I think people are very good at telling others to be patient. But it's hard for them themselves to practice it. But something happens, not something practical, maybe for our audience, that when you have maybe um, when you see social media sometimes, no, or you see mm. what WhatsApp groups, you know, in which all of a sudden people start just saying things about everybody, and it's wrong. Oh, yeah. So bear wrongs patiently is a is a very practical. But also, you shouldn't be the one wronging others. That's unjust. Very interesting. So there we go. Seven spiritual works of mercy. Mm -hmm. Teach the ignorant. Pray for the living and the dead. Correct sinners. Counsel those in doubt. Console the sorrowful. Bear wrongs patiently and forgive wrongs willingly. A lot of homework eh, after this, uh, yes. this conversation is, we, is. all of us have. So it's, it's not just, you know, uh, lay back, relax, because uh, God is mercy. No? <laughs> he is merciful. He is. But he also wants us to toe the line, too. So, Father, maybe we can finish this very interesting conversation that I'm sure, uh, and I hope as well, no, it's going to be very constructive for all those who are with us uh, in the program today. Maybe we could ask God's blessing to be able to receive this mercy and also be instruments and vehicles of the mercy as well. I think we should also remember, you know, uh, what the Lord Jesus Christ did just before dying. Among the, uh, the, the, the seven last words of our Lord Jesus Christ, we find several of them regarding mercy. Hmm? Because, uh, first of all, he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. So, <laughs> our, our Lord is asking forgiveness to the Father to those who are uh, kill, crucifying him. Actively doing evil. Yeah. Cursing him. Doing all kinds of horrible things. And he's saying, be merciful. They don't understand. Precisely. Then he, uh, he tells, when he, uh, he addresses the, uh, the good thief, today you will be with me in paradise. So, you know, our, our Lord is forgiving this uh, sinner who is next to him, this criminal who was a thief. And he uh, wants to, uh, to make it clear that um, this is the last thing that he wants to do before dying. Uh, he, he wants to forgive somebody before he dies. And then uh, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So he's uh, remembering his father, please have mercy on me. <laughs> so he's asking his father to have mercy on him because he knows that his father is mercy. And that's, the, that's what his father wants to do. I think also he's also teaching us that when we're at our last moment, we should say the same thing. Exactly. Call upon God's mercy of to course. spill over us. Of course. Beautiful. Because this is what, what God wants to do to us. He wants to be mercy. He wants to be merciful. So if we ask him, he will do it. And he will do it with pleasure because this is he, the essence of uh, divinity is mercy, is love. So we're going to, uh, to ask through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, who was the mother of mercy, in that sense, and through intercession of Sister Faustina, who received so many messages of mercy from our Lord Jesus Christ, the blessing of Almighty God on all of you, all those who are following us in this uh, postcard. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Go in peace. Thanks be to God. God.